<laughs> All right, I feel a little, a little bit bad. I got more applause now in total and more time, but uh, hopefully it's worth it. Um, so I want to talk about breaking up the monolith. I think we can skip the first couple of slides. Um, I quickly want to repeat again that architectures are about trade-offs, so keep that in mind. There's nothing absolute here. The right architecture is just like right for your company. Uh, just take this as, as a bit of inspiration. So the talk will be about the traditional monolith, how you can break up a monolith into layers and services. An important component of that is service-to-service -service communication. And then we'll look into three case studies for how other architectures could look like. So again, this talk um, won't cover anything about the right path, infrastructure, deployment, but we'll just talk about data abstractions and the, the read path. So let's start with the traditional monolith, or as DHH calls it, the majestic monolith. So popular frameworks here is Ruby on Rails, Laravel, or Django in, in Python. And this is a super successful approach, but at some point just breaks down. So we'll look into that. So there are three layers, typically. Um, nowadays, your front-end layer is really like mostly a standalone component that you build in React or in a, in a native app. Your backend, that's what the actual monolith is, and the backend then talks to your, talks to your database. Um, a mo building a monolith is uh, super easy, so and it's a great development experience. It's easy to debug, and you don't run into any problems of distributed computing, and it's easy to, to set up and deploy. The problems, though, as your monolith grows, is that you run into problems of development velocity. Uh, again, for, for me, one of the most significant downsides is that you're really stuck with the technology you've chosen. Um, like sometimes it's like many years back, and there are new frameworks, new technologies, maybe even a new language. So that's difficult to change. It also is quite difficult to change such a big system in one way. So there are different subsystems have different um, resource requirements. So your monolith be becomes really a bottleneck there. Um, and also the code, code complexity. So you either have to be very, very diligent in how you structure everything, but very often this still leads to like violation of separation of concerns and, and blurry boundaries. So let's take a look how we can break up that monolith, how we can break up that complexity into layers and services. So why layers and services? Well, these are basically the two dimensions that we can break it up in. So horizontally across domain boundaries into various services, and vertically into abstraction layers. So each layer uh, and each service can either be part of a bigger infrastructure unit or can sometimes also be uh, deployed as a standalone infrastructure component. Um, and what's the most interesting aspect of this is as you're thinking in services and layers, um, some of these layers can even be auto-generated based on adjacent layers. So let's look at some of the complexity that we have in a monolith. So on the one side, we have blurry boundaries in, inside of your monolith, and you have coupling between some of these logical domains. So this is what you want to break up into services. And on the other side, you might have separation of concerns vertically through your monolith, so, um, and especially how you handle state. And this is where you want to introduce abstraction layers that make that easier to, to manage. So I want to give you a framework here for how you can think about um, data abstractions. So I think most of you are already familiar with this, but we can quickly walk through it. Um, we won't cover the presentation layer, which is mostly like your, your front-end application, your React app. Um, and we also won't uh, go in, in depth about the database layer. There's so many options. This, <laughs> the entire conference is about this. What we want to quickly review, and there are a lot of other great talks about this today, is the API layer, where you define your GraphQL schema, where you implement your resolvers. The next part is the domain model. This is where you would actually want to implement most of your business logic. So you, let's say you build a web shop and you have a model called order. This is where you would have, for example, a function that, con that submits your order. This is where you implement your business logic. 
and a layer deeper, that's where the dat data access layer sits. This is all about efficient data querying, um, caching, and all of that. This, this is um, also a stateful component that handles connection pooling, etc. So let's take a look at some of the challenges that we have if we break up the monolith into different layers and different services, we have a couple of challenges. One is, uh, if these are different infrastructure components, we need to communicate between these. So we don't just have a variable that we can use, but we need to communicate between these. So this is all about service-to-service -service communication. We want to build a system where we don't lose a great developer experience, where we don't lose type safety across these. And this also introduces a, a bit of more infrastructure setup. Uh, but we don't have time to cover that today. But again, if you want to talk about this, find me afterwards. So let's dive into service-to-service -service communication. The goal of this is how you would communicate between these services, between these layers. And there are two ways how this could generally be done, either synchronously using a request response pattern or asynchronously, for example, using a pattern like message passing. So a couple of design considerations here. Uh, we want to come up with a solution that works across platforms, across languages. Um, we want to make it as efficient as possible. It should have like low network overhead um, and should also have low serialization overhead. And ultimately, we want to end up with a workflow that works as well as we, as we had it in a, uh, in a monolithic uh, application. And one of the great tools to achieve that is code generation. So how it works is, let's say, we have service A, service B. Service, um, service B wants to talk to service A. The way how this works is that for each service, there's automatically generated a client mapped to the corresponding language that the other services want to use it in. Um, and these services can then basically, the, these other services then can talk to, uh, to a service that they want to talk to using this client. Uh, and what that does is, typically using a request response pattern, it sends the data across in a serialized format. So the wire protocol, what's used um, for, for, the, for, <coughs> for the communication is mostly HTTP or, or gRPC. And for serialization, there are a lot of different frameworks, that, that, uh, a lot of different formats that you can use. Um, Protobuf, Thrift, MessagePack, there, there's, a, there's a whole family of these. And um, to, achieve this, uh, to achieve this and make this easier to, to use on a day-to-day -day basis, there are also frameworks and tooling that you can use. So the most popular probably being gRPC and Thrift. So the code generation uh, roughly looks like this, that you first define a schema for your particular schema, uh, for, for a particular service. You then choose a programming language, and a CLI then scaffolds, on the one hand, scaffolds the server code for the service you want to build, and then also generates client libraries for these services that you want to talk to. Uh, here's an example snippet uh, what you would run in your terminal if you would want to use gRPC and, and protobuf. So what has all of that to do with GraphQL? We are still at a GraphQL conference here. So the Interesting idea here is like we see we define a schema um, and code generation and all of that. We have all of that in GraphQL. So what you can actually do is you can use GraphQL for service-to-service -service communication, especially with GraphQL bindings. So a binding, if you're not familiar with it, and you can also look it up on, on GitHub, is basically a generated schema-specific GraphQL client that you can use to other GraphQL services. And the coolest part about this is that you can also use schema delegation or schema stitching under the hood, which allows you to build um, layered GraphQL APIs. So not just give me a little bit of data, but that you can build your APIs in a, in a, uh, in a layered way. So here's a code snippet how like, the usage of a binding would look like in, in JavaScript. So to give the people who also have an understanding of gRPC a bit of, a, uh, a bit of understanding how they compare to each other. Uh, I always think about it like you would use, when you would use C++ or when you would use something like Node, Ruby, and Python, it's basically a matter of 
how low level, how, how much do you want to go, um, how much weight do you want to put on performance versus how agile and flexible do you want to be. So this is where I think GraphQL sits on the flexible and, and on that, that you can get stuff done very quickly. And gRPC, you rather have to take care of some low level details. Um, but it's basically a matter of what tool you want to use um, in, in which, which situation. Um, the one th I, I don't want to go too deep here in, into all of these points. Uh, as of the implementation, the difference is that for GraphQL, you have to implement your resolver systems like you're probably used to it. For gRPC, you rather have to implement single handler functions. But uh, if you're interested in that, there, there's a lot of material on, uh, about that. Or uh, just find me after the talk. So the part that I'm most excited about that this really enables is that you end up um, with a system that's even though it's decoupled and distributed, uh, you can still accomplish end-to-end -end type safety. So what that means is your front end, up until your database, everything is type safe that provides a great developer experience and catches so many, so many problems right at build time. Uh, and that paired with a great CI or CD setup really provides a lot of benefits. So let's, now that we understand how you would break it up into various services and layers and how service-to-service -service communication looks like and work, works, uh, let's look into three architecture case studies. So I've, I want to show you three today. The, the first one is um, the stateless monolith. So like evolution of a, a, a typical monolith. Then we also want to look into a microservice architecture and then into a service, uh, into a layered service architecture. So starting off with the stateless monolith, the core idea is you still want to keep all of the benefits of a monolith, but you want to make it easier to scale. <clears throat> and the, the idea that you, that you use here is that you push down every state into, into different layers. So one of the stateful components that you typically have is around connection pooling, caching, and all of that. So you can basically push that out, out of your monolith into, into a data access layer. Um, also, um, you can keep push various infrastructure layers uh, above the monolith, for example, how you handle web sockets. And that leaves you in your monolith with the API and with the, uh, with the API layer and with the domain model. And everything, and this can be completely stateless. So this is uh, in, and obviously these architectures that I present here is a simplification compared to what a lot of other companies run in production and just shows a certain, uh, certain dimension of it. But in a similar form, this is what's deployed at Facebook, this is deployed what's, um, at, at Artsy. And I think that's a really great foundation uh, to, to build new systems. One of the biggest pros about this, especially if, if you don't want to think too much about uh, infrastructure, is that you can mostly deploy it on, on serverless, on serverless infrastructure. Um, but ultimately, you're not going to solve all of the other problems of a monolith. Um, this is where a microservice architecture might be an interesting approach. So it definitely looks quite a bit more sophisticated. The idea here is that you have um, that you basically push all your business logic into smaller services. Um, and so you basically have your domain model now in, in these microservices. And, and the GraphQL API gateway layer on top of it can often be auto-generated and ties all of this together. Another uh, important note about microservices is that they also talk a lot uh, to each other. So, the biggest benefit about this, and this is why most companies adopt it, is that you really it forces you to be uh, to it forces you to, to to be diligent and provides very rigid boundaries, and it also from an operational perspective allows you to scale these services independently. The <coughs> downside of this is obviously that you have quite a bit of more infrastructure overhead. The last architecture I want to show is a variation of that, um, what's what we call the layered service architecture. And we actually had a fairly interesting blog post from, from Airbnb about this uh, shortly. 
So it's very similar to the microservice architecture. The only difference is that you additionally also have presentation services. Um, the idea here is that your application developers have now a lot of more control and flexibilities how they shape the schema they actually need for their applications. In many cases, um, this even means that the front-end developers have com com complete control over how these schemas are uh, implemented and deployed. And using um, GraphQL bindings and schema delegation, this makes it super simple to, to build them, since you basically just need to define the, the schema, and from there on you can reroute how the data is being resolved. So that wraps up the, the architecture part. The key takeaways for you today is that no matter what architecture you currently have or what systems you want to build, GraphQL is a great foundation for that architecture since it's so flexible and can, can be used across so, uh, so many layers. Um, GraphQL is a fantastic tool for service-to-service -service communication. And if you're building a new system, I think a stateless monolith um, architecture is a really good starting point to, to get started. One quick word on what we're doing. You've seen the data abstractions architecture before, the Dottis framework, and you've seen the data access layer. This is exactly what we're working on with Prisma. So we're building an open source data access layer that speaks GraphQL and is compatible, ultimately compatible with any kind of database. So if you're building a new GraphQL server, or if you have an existing infrastructure and you want to put GraphQL over your databases to build your own, uh, your own API, um, go, go check it out. So if you're also interested in working in open source, we're also hiring. So feel free to talk to us afterwards. And that's it. Thank you so much.